Hello guys, thanks very much for joining us this evening. Pro Arms Derby UK live stream. Special guest this evening is Stephen Feeney. Um, what can I say about Stephen Feeney? Uh, well, a, he's top coach in the UK, specialist snooker, darts, ring coach also. Um, achievements, three world snooker champions, Stuart Bingham, Mark Williams, Roddy O'Sullivan. Uh, founder of SiteRight. SiteRight has achieved 38 plus world snooker titles, 30 runner ups. You know, Steve has coached 35 tour professionals uh, with the SiteRight methods, which is very, very significant. And he's with us, Davis, old men, now they are, you know. We're all old men now, actually. Even Stephen. Steve as the best technical coach he's worked with. Um, I don't know. He's achieved it all. He's done everything. So all I can do is just bring Steve in. Stephen, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hi Dave. All right, so we'll just let that stream build itself up again. I don't know what it is, but it's like a feeling, you know. Stephen, thanks for joining us. Uh, terrific achievement, great career. You know, the, the work that you've done with Site, right? We're going to talk about all of that as we get through. We're going to touch on a lot of different matters as we go through the stream. And like all, I want to bring, you know, obviously if you're on for the first time, like all the professionals I've had on and many others, I always like to get a little bit of a background profile. And I want to start with that. I want to start with you. I want to talk about yourself. Let's start from the beginning uh, and how it extended itself to Snooker, coaching, site right? Um, well, I it's, it's a long story. Uh, I'll try and I'll try and do what they call the elevator speech, but it might be 105 floors rather than 30 seconds. Um, that was the that was the height of the twin towers. 105 floors took a minute and 25 seconds, I think. Um, look, I, I was a pretty good sports uh, kid. I used to play football, cricket when I was young. Captain both uh, both teams, and uh, in particular cricket. And um, the reason I mention cricket is because uh, I think uh, there's there's quite a strong relation into into what I'll be looking at um, around the junior scene. Um, because I was a good cricketer, um, I was typically left-handed writing, but I batted right-handed, bowled right-handed, and uh, I was typically a middle off guard. Which back in my day, which is what forty odd years ago. That wasn't the done thing because of LBW, and uh, and I'll hit that story a bit later. Except to say that um, going up to uh, a pretty good school with a scholarship, I couldn't wait to get into the county team. Couldn't wait to play cricket at the top level, and uh, that particular sports coach would not allow me to take a middle off guard. He put me into middle middle leg, and I was bowled within three balls every single time. I used to try and get back to middle off guard, it would be Feeney, middle, middle leg. But sir, I get bowled out every time. Anyway, within a short space of time, uh, total confidence had gone. Um, bowling, you know, somebody bowled 10 out of 20 overs, gone. So I was a pretty good, pretty good cricketer, 10 out of 20 overs in those days, um, when it was maximum 20 over matches. And the reason I refer to that is because, um, I've never watched cricket since um, because uh, I was destroyed. Now, let's take a view that if that coach didn't know what he was doing to me as a, as a junior, as a youngster, and just following a prescribed blueprint, um, he destroyed my game. I will explain later on, maybe we can connect the loop. But let's just remember that I'm typically left-handed and I bowled right-handed and batted right-handed. Captain of the team, batted number one, bowled 10 out of 20 overs. 
destroyed. So school just became sort of academic for me, did pretty well. Um, I went into banking and uh, I was introduced to snooker at the old railway club. Um, this was young, we used to cycle down there. This is when they had the old balls and my goodness, I could screw back one of those old balls. Um, the length of the table, believe it or not. Um, but then obviously the game moved forward. Um, schooling was more important to me. And then I kind of became more infatuated with the game in my early 20s and uh, I didn't really progress that quickly um, it was more about league play um, we won virtually every single thing in the league from open team handicap you name it we won it um, we became pretty dominant we, we kind of we kind of knocked out the old guard but I, I learned to play the game in a social club um, St Phillips social club and I think it's worth remembering them and then um, as I became better, I kind of advanced up to what we knew then as the Canary Coup Club. It was 24, ta 20, 24 tables reduced to 22. And I used to have my own uh, table down, what we used to call the back room. The back room was in, in that club was where you always wanted to get into the last eight of the Norwich Open. And for years, I tried to win that Norwich Open. I eventually won the Norwich Open in 1997, the year that I helped Terry Griffiths retire at the Crucible. That was a year after my father died. And it's quite emotional, really. I didn't think I would sort of feel that way, but uh, that cup was an awesome cup, and I tried for years. The back room is what we used to call it, the last day. Through that process, I um, tried so many coaching books to improve my game. I knocked them on the head. Um, and then I just played naturally. And then eventually I was playing Barry Pinchers, and I remember I missed a shot. Now, I'm left-handed as a snooker player, um, and I played a shot, missed it, and Barry said, how did you miss that, Steve? So it's all Barry Pinchers' fault. The next day I went down to the local, uh, what we know as Jarrells in Norwich, bought How I Play Snooker by Joe Davis, and look, this book, you know, we stand on the shoulders of all of these, these coaches of the past. They taught what they believed they knew or how they played. Um, and, you know, they were the gurus of the day. Within a few months, I couldn't pop long ball. Um, and I, I was known as, as quite a, a, you know, one of the best improvers around at that stage. So I kind of destroyed my game just following books and went back to the books, Frank Callan's um snooker clinic um terry griffiths jack carnham i studied them all and uh it didn't help my game um so i was destroyed um, again for the second time in a sport that i loved a good um referee and sadly he's passed on now albert stewart i believe his name was from memory um he introduced me to a good coach called john Waskett, and I used to travel to Chelmsford and then coaching was £25 an hour. So I travelled from Norwich to Chelmsford and I believe sadly some coaches are still only charging that level. And so in my in my field, the level of either skill or value of those coaches has not moved forward with the times. But nevertheless, I paid £25 an hour for that coach and he helped me. I started making centuries again. But as a left-hander, he taught me to play left leg on line, tape on the floor, and do all the bits and bobs that um, was in the, the Bible of those days. So white tape would go across the table on the floor under the, under the middle pockets. I put my left leg on line, and I kind of learned to play with my left leg on line, left foot on line, the arch of my foot almost on this white tape. I started to make centuries again, but through all pro-ams and things, I never stopped studying players and I used to copy players. So I made it my business to understand all of a different player's technique to the point where I almost have a photographic memory for every player's technique. And if they change anything, I see it. So if Mark Selby changes something, I see it. Um, any player, Ronnie, you name it, if they change something, I would have already studied them. It doesn't take me long to, to figure out what they're doing, how they're doing it, because I used to copy things which is how a lot of people learned how to try or try to improve we used to copy things off the tv not realizing mm -hmm. that um, there was a different angle you weren't seeing things for real unless you went to events and then saw things anyway um 
I remember putting twenty pound note on the table with John Waskett and saying, "You're lining me up on this shot, John. That isn't straight to me." So, um, within my quest to find out what was wrong, I eventually got to see Frank Callan. Now, again, we're talking about you know the coaches with a huge prestige. You know, to see Frank Callan was like, "Wow, this man will know my problem." Mm-hmm. You know, I used to be able to pop these balls. You know, and I've made numerous centuries you know that i don't count and uh i drove all the way up to uh to preston and what a guy do you understand i think is how i used to remember him saying things i went there with two two objectives to learn how i see straight what was my dominant eye in terms of how the books used to teach and the books only used to talk about dominant eyes they never used to be able to prove it and they used to have certain uh, certain methods you know the various different things and and over time i proved that they are unreli- unreliable so um i wanted to know am i online and technique so am i aiming am i am i sighting perfectly and is my technique bang online i was given the chalk test <laughs> bless him if he's up there listening i hope i hope he has a laugh at it but i was given the chalk test so i pointed at the chalk i stood near the middle bag pointed at the chalk on the far end of the black rail so I'm at a 45 degree angle pointing at the chalk and uh, did the test and he diagnosed me as even eyed. Okay, so for me, the best coach in the world has diagnosed me as even eyed. Now that problem is gone. That still left me with a few questions though because John Waskett's got me left leg on line. And my left leg is not under the center of my eyes. Mm-hmm. Makes sense? Anyway, so I got home. Well, sorry, this is where the journey really began to be, be, become fun. I got to Kings Lynn, 45 miles from home. So in those days with the cars we drove, that was another hour. Suddenly, suddenly Stephen Feeney starts to have palpitations um, and starts to think, wow, no, I'm not sure. I've been tested with my right hand on the chalk. But I'm left-handed. What happens if I now get to the club and I do and I do the same test and I get a different result? So I went straight to the canary queue, set up the test, and got a different result because I pointed at the chalk with my left finger. So from right finger to left finger, why weren't the results the same? And this this bothered me big time, absolutely big time. I've just been to the best coach in the world who's done the typical eye dominance test. And um, I just wanted to know how I see straight. I haven't found any optician who could do that up until that time anyway. And um, I just want to know how I see straight. How do I aim? This game is a, is, a, is a game of geometry. Two balls, same size. How do I see straight through the center of the cue ball to line up a dead straight shot? And um, so, so it was really from there that um, I did the test and I just sadly might seem arrogant, but at the time, how could I trust what I've been told by what I believe to be the best expert in the game? No book mm-hmm. could prove to me how I saw straight. No coach could prove to me how I saw straight. And to date, no player at golf, snooker or darts, and I've, and I've challenged the best. They won't, some won't take the test. And I've tested them, and no one has passed the test. Because... So many of these games are played by feel, not visual first. Now, to me, that's the start before the horse. In an accuracy sport, we aim first, whereas Terry used to say, well, players play on feel. So I understand all that because I used to. So anyway, so now I'm in a non-believer stage again. I think, oh, I found the results. I, I, you know, this should be great. And... Um, and eventually, um, I was doing what a lot of snooker players do, trying, you know, you go home and, and uh, I was doing something on the iron board and suddenly something appeared to me. And from that moment on, I developed sight right. I remember the patent attorney who came around saying, wow, this is some ilk. Never seen this ilk, anything of this ilk before. And I instantly realized that sight right could be used for golf, snooker and darts and all accuracy sports. So patented, um, patented Q, um, patented butter, um, and within that field, 
I was able to very quickly understand how someone sees straight and how they needed to aim behind the shot, behind the cue ball. There's a biomechanical element to this, which we'll deal with at another stage. But in my life, because I stood left leg on line at a, at a, a 20 degrees turn across my body to try and see the shot. If you look at Jimmy, he's quite wider. And as you grow older, your body spreads. So that degree of error becomes bigger. Your body turns and you end up with biomechanical issues, not just from being offline, all right, but also for trying to view along the line naturally. So I've had some people on, on site, right, who have so far and lean so far across the shot to see straight through the center of the cue ball. So we're in an accuracy sport and I've got coaches and players, nobody has passed my tests. So that advance bit, I'll rewind a bit. We're still in the elevator, probably about the 70th floor. Um, at that stage, I thought, wow, I've got something, I'm onto something here. This is this is huge. This is huge. So I phoned Terry Griffiths and I said. Terry, because I knew he was retired, I knew he was going through the qualifiers for the world, 27 January. Terry, <laughs> um, it was Frank who gave me, the, gave me his number. Bless him. So I have a lot to thank Frank for, and I have a lot to thank Terry for in a moment. So I gave, so I phoned Terry, Terry, look, um, how do you know if you're sighting a straight line of aim perfectly? And his answer was, I don't you better come and see me. And from there on in, um, through somebody like John Was, well, Albert Stewart, John Waskett, well, Barry Pinch, it's his fault. <laughs> it was all his fault. <laughs> ben Joe Davis's book, all the books I'd studied, because I was pretty academically, you know, intelligent. Um, so through all the books I'd studied, all of my own analysis of players, and, uh, and I've got to this moment where Terry, so I go down and see him. Terry was offline. Now, Terry was suffering with huge back problems, neck problems, needed to get through. I think it was two qualifiers, but I remember he beat Alfie Burden to qualify for the Crucible. Um, so within, what, three months, January to April, four months, he's gone through the qualifiers. It's the first time I'd ever been to the Crucible. Still haven't won the Norwich Open, mind. First time I'd ever been to the Crucible, I sat as a, as a VIP guest of Terry's. Now I know he could have given me better. So, Terry, if you're listening, um, I sat as a VIP guest of his. To me, this was very special already. Right at the back of the Crucible. Um, and when Terry walked out, uh, there was a lump in my throat. Because he walked out in the first round against the world number three at the time, who we know, who we know as Mark Williams. And, and he was 9-8 um, in front. So I actually thought he was going to beat him. And I understand a lot of people in Wales backed him to win more than five frames. But the difference to Terry's game, but there was one thing that he never, and he will always say, he couldn't recognise the shots. He just knew he needed to stand in the appropriate place. His eyes had been trained offline for so, for so many years. And Terry was always looking for the secret and the answers to beat Steve Davis. Because Terry, Terry was knocked out of so many tournaments because he met Steve in the semis. So suddenly, so so Terry then, on the back of this, I've gone to the awards ceremony and sat beside Lee Walker, of all people. All right. And now Lee Walker is one of my coaches. And we're doing a lot of work together as we talk about the junior scene coming through. But I've sat special VIP guest of um, Lee Walker, Young Player of the Year Award. And uh, anyway, that moved on. Terry referred me to Steve. Steve Davis, he referred me to um, Neil Foles. He hadn't made a century for a long time. And after the session I had with Neil Foles, I believe he made 135 the next day. Now, now, now Neil's game was really struggling at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was a good friend of Terry's. So Neil Foles knows a little bit about side right um, and the tests that I've conducted with him. But these were on old boards and stuff that I pulled together. So I was kind of branded as a bit of a bank manager you know, a loony bank manager by Steve Davis at one stage that kind of said, um, you know, could, could line up people for the shot, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, I did more than that, um, a lot more than that. Um, and 
to the point where eventually Steve Davis said sight right made me feel like a player again when he got to the final of the UK champs in 2005. So I expected sort of lots of things to happen from there and they kind of didn't, which was really weird. Um, but in fairness, I then went, you know, I started to look at a lot of golf. Steve Davis recommended me to Eddie Hearn for Greg Owen. Greg Owen finished runner up at the Bay Hill after me working. I had, I had Eddie Hearn texting me constantly from the Bay Hill International, you know, Greg's part of he's part of another 25 foot putt. So they kind of got me into the golf where I probably mm -hmm. snooker was my passion. But in golf, I'm Greg Owen, Stevie Gallagher helped him get to the Ryder Cup um, and win the Dubai Desert Classic twice. Um, Darren Clark, when Darren Clark won in 2008, hadn't won for five years. That was a phone call from me to Chubby. So all of these things, I could help people identify if they were offline. But in turn, let's remember, if you're offline, you're probably manipulating your technique. You're probably manipulating Steve, your, this, your cue action. Is this, uh, is, is this a cross dominance thing? You know, uh, you're, you're trying to help people with, I mean, I'm, I'm right haunted and left eyed, which is a bit of a problem for me because I, I don't feel like I'm laying in the shadow probably. Is, is, it, is this predominantly a cross dominance problem? With, 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 guys? Um, no, 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 it's not. You know, some, someone said, I think it might have been Alan McManus said recently that an inside dominant eye is, is the best you can have. I never used to believe that. I actually used to believe that the outside dominant eye was the best because especially if someone was setting you up right-handed, right leg on line, you wanted to be right eye because if you were left eye dominant, then you'd be all over the shop and, uh, you know, I, I have a big problem, you know, and uh, when, when I look through the game and, and, and I eventually got the site right cue sanctioned by the WPBSA, um, you know, Jason Ferguson has, has, has said site right should be in every queue. Um, and he must have said that to me, I don't know, 30 times, every time I see him virtually, um, you know, and, and I think sometimes I, I was ahead. I was ahead of the game. I was ahead of. I was ahead of a time when people would um, would want to listen and, and would want to listen to somebody challenging, you know, what was in the script for so many years. Um, and, you know, I think I think that tells quite a story. And, and I think what backs that up is my first, the first, outside Greg Owen, um, I saw Nick Faldo at Brockett Hall. And Nick Faldo went through the tests and his swing coach got so angry behind him to the point where Nick Fowler said to a swing coach at the time, well, you come and have a look. You'd be tested. And he was offline too, and he couldn't handle it. So let's let's imagine that, that someone like me 20 odd years ago, there is, Steve Davis, I think, you know, my wife was there. He just said, well, you're a genius. Um, and, you know, I remember him saying that in, in, in his room, you know, and, and, so, so there's a part of me that kind of figures, mm. okay, so, you know, where is the game? Where is the WPBSA with sight right at this stage? Um, because I have coaches coming to me. But let's remember that we have, you know, people who have supposedly known everything, done everything, the textbook is written, the tablets of stone are there, and the paradigm shift has come along that says, you got that wrong. That's not entirely right. Those tests are not reliable. You're offline. I've shown it to you. I've proven it to you. So how are you going to deal with that? Now, that is like me saying you've been driving a car, sat in the passenger seat for 20 years, and I put you into the driver's seat, and instead of looking left to right, you think you're looking right to left because your eyes have been trained to look left to right for so many years. Steve, <laughs> Uh, the process. I mean, this is this is going to be a little bit complicated for some of the some of the viewers here, some of the young players who are watching us, trying to understand or, or get the grips of of the process of of explaining what sight right. So, if, if if a player with with some ability comes to you and and wants to improve a lot of the things, let's just talk us through the, the kind of process that you would go through on the table. 
I think um, the first thing I will say to a player is, look, you come to me because you want to change. You know that there's something wrong in your game. And, um, and what I will do is show you the truth. I will show you how you see straight. I will prove to you how you see straight. And from that information, I will then help you realign your technique and develop the correct stance and the correct cue action aligned to how you see straight. Um, and in doing so, once I've learned how you see straight, you will, learn to, you will learn to trust me that I will put you on the line of aim for every shot, even though you can't recognize it initially. So that process becomes, wow, what? When they take the test and they see different shots around the table, that they're actually way off line in the way they're sighting and the way they're standing behind the shot. Essentially, their standing position behind the cue ball is offline. And they're trying to do all sorts to get their eyes on the line first. So that they're, some people say the head is in the wrong position. No, it's your eyes. It's like me giving you, you shoot. It's like me giving you a gun and you're looking across the sights on a gun purposely. And you've actually been coached to do that. I like it. And you've actually been coached to look across the sights purposely because the sights aren't there to prove that you're looking straight. You know, so so suddenly I kind of put the sights on on this individual, but they can't see that yet because they've been looking across the line or they've been totally feel orientated. So then what I do is I take them first through the tests, show them how they see straight, learn how they see straight. I'll tell you a story about this one in a minute. You'll like it. Learn how they see straight, the hidden stuff, the facts. Learn how they see straight. Then I take them through a technical process to help them learn to step into the shot to drop the butt of the cue on the line of A from the standing position. Now that's very important. So they learn to stand perfectly behind the line of aim first before they step into the shot to drop the butt of the cue on the line of aim that they chose. Any fool can put the tip of the cue to the cue ball. If the butt of the cue is offline, you're going to cue through offline or you're going to manipulate through. So I will challenge anybody in terms of those elements, you can hit a cue ball dead straight and you can sight straight to the center of the cue ball and you can put the butt of the cue bang on the center line of the cue ball to deliver straight through the cue ball. Now that gives us some huge advantages which are for another day perhaps. And to do that, so they learn to stand behind the center line of the cue ball, step into the shot, drop the butt of the cue on the line of aim, on the line of aim that they chose. So now they can at least trust that even if they've got the angle wrong, they've done what they should do for the line of aim they chose. Now then what I do is I pull together a huge number of really important sight right routines to help them recalibrate where they need to be stood behind the cue ball for every angle. And that can happen pretty quick for some people, others take a bit longer. But the one thing that I never have to do, so I've dealt with, I've dealt with perfect that way they see straight, first of all. Um, now I'm helping them understand how they use that knowledge to then work their technique. And I work their stance, their cue action, and you, you, you know, I'll have to say they're the easiest things to do. Cue action can be a bit different, but the technique, putting your right foot here and your left foot there and putting your left leg online and your right leg online, that's the hokey cokey to me, I'm afraid. Hate to say it, but it is. Um, and, you know, I know that there are certain players even now that think they're sighting perfectly, and they aren't. And I have proof of it. I have proof of it. I'm not going to name any names at the moment, but I have proof of it. I study them. Okay, so um, that's my job. So once we turn around and get that player sighting perfectly, learning to sight every line of aim perfectly, there's now no more guesswork. So they learn to step into the shop, form a great stance, a professional stance, as I will call it, and a cue action that now drops into position with that stance. And it's almost as if we were made to play snooker, most people. There's only a few times where we have a problem physically. Some people would say, and I'm going to mention his name, some people would say Stephen Lee. He was a great cueist. If I'd have sight-righted Stephen Lee, I'd have been very proud. Because Stephen Lee is an awesome player because... He's got a lot of things going right all at the same time. Okay? Now, whether or not he fell onto that naturally, even John Higgins has tried to move his sighting line. All the, all the history and all the tapes show you. 
So here's, here's then what Stephen Feely's party trick is. And I did this with Andy Goldstein and Ronnie in the Eurosport studio. It's never come to light. I'm going to talk about it. Facts. Andy asked me to demonstrate. So I demonstrate with Andy. I said, okay, set up a ball wherever you like. So he sets up a ball, the cue ball in bolt. I said, okay, I've already worked out how he sees straight. <laughs> right? Without any tests. So I've, I've, I've got it to that level. Anyway, so I then said, okay, you line up for that shot the way you line up and just run it in gently. So he does and he misses it and he misses it thin, which I knew he would. Okay, I said, okay, now trust me. Set the shot up again. Cameras were on this time. So we set him up. I move him to behind the line for him to step in and he drops it in dead weight. The camera was behind my head, so he didn't see it. So Andy goes, can you do anything better than that? I said, okay. I said, come on then. So we went again. He set the balls up. Um, Ronnie was standing behind him. I'm standing in front of him. The cameras are doing the right thing now. And uh, I've moved Andy to the correct siding line. He's come and down on the shot. And now I've asked him to close his eyes on his paws. And he's dropped the ball in dead weight, perfect, with his eyes closed. They have that footage. Facts. That's how good. So I, I can learn to see how someone sees straight. I know how to I know every line of aim from the other end. Sad, isn't it? But I do. Um, and I can make sure that once I know how someone sees straight, I put them on that line of aim for the shot for them to step in, drop the butt of the cue online and just drop the ball in. And that is a bigger wow factor than when they first realize that they're offline. And when that happens, when they realize they're offline. Look, can you recognize that, Steve, when you watch a player? I mean, uh, I know you coach everybody, but... Yeah. When you watch players on yeah. TV that you've never yeah. met before, players on the tour who play, can you recognize these 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 things as soon as you watch yeah. them play? Yeah. And and say, and say to your it's easy. The, I, I can help yeah, him. Easy. I can help him. I can help him improve so much. Yeah. Yeah. Every, everybody was wowing about Sam Craigie this year. I did twenty four hours with Sam Craigie on the table. Everybody was wowing over over his improvement, you know. And listen, I, I I used to learn in a high performance arena that you can give the best plan to everybody. So you can have the best plan in the world. You can have the best coaching program in the world. You can have the best performance plan in the world. You can have the best business plan in the world. But the person who works it the best gets the best mm -hmm. results. So. So when I turn around and look at what Sightright does, I, I take a view that says Sightright is in two parts. Chris Henry likes to call it the visual side. I will call it the perfect siding and aiming to understand how you see perfectly straight for every shot. If you're not doing that, then you've got a compensation going on, which will inevitably, more often than not, lead to some form of manipulation in the technique. OK, it'd be like you trying to sight and aim a gun to the left of it and then firing and moving it to the right. So you need to manipulate to aim perfectly. So, so when we turn around and look at those two sides, perfect sighting and aiming, understanding how you see straight. How can a coach really coach a player in accuracy sport unless they understand exactly how they see perfectly straight? Is that not where an accuracy sport starts? How you wouldn't even begin to fire a gun until you've aimed it perfectly. Well, it's very much like then the technical side follows. So the technical side for me stands as easy as my foot. Sorry. Same discipline with, with target shooting. Precision target shooting is 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 side pitcher. Yeah. Timing. Yeah. Very murder snugger. Yeah. And then, and then the technical side comes with, yeah, with, with the technique and the cue action. Now, now I, I will take people through, believe it or not, a lot of long shots I shut. 
And there are different reasons, which I'm not going to go into them, um, but there are very, very strong reasons why I do this. Um, so, for example, I have, I'll have eight long shots and I'll look for them to be potted with eyes shut. And there are players that have done it. You know, and these are long pots. So these are long pots, eyes shut on the pools. And, and I mean at pace. So if you look at someone like Mark, when he was having a bit of fun in the world, in the 2018 world, where he was closing his eyes, it's because sometimes when, you, when you've trained your eyes to see a certain shot for so many years, if you can trust that you're already bang on line before you step in and you've stepped in perfectly, if what you're looking at down over the queue doesn't look right compared to your habits, then, then close your well, eyes. Closing. Interesting. All right. And uh, very, very significant thing because it tells you a lot of things. Uh, closing your eyes and opening your eyes. Yeah. And and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's not a gimmick. Um, no, we're okay. Carry on, buddy. Signal, Carry on. Cool. So, so, yeah, I do. I recognize everything across. It froze on the screen there, Steve. <laughs> Maybe you'll come back. Your signal is a little bit uh, slightly distorted there. Just hang on a second, guys. Wait for Steve to come back and play this back. We'll find out that we're just talking across each other. Stranger things have happened. Steve, if you can't hear me, do you want to try and come back in again? I'll take you out and try and come back in again. All right, just take Steve out there for a wee second, guys. See if we can bring him back in again. I hope you absorbed all of that information. We'll be talking about the queue very shortly. Steve has introduced the queue, the site rate queue. I'm going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the state of the game as well. We're going to touch on a lot of things. Regarding that, as we wait for Steve to come back in again, I think a lot of significant things there. Stephen was talking about in, te in terms of lining up the shot, and uh, I think a lot of us have that problem where we think we're actually lining the shot correctly, where in fact we're not. Uh, it's to do with a lot of things, and, and very often that ha it needs to be observed from someone from the outside. You know, myself and Chris Henry have talked about that. Quite a few times, but it's very, very significant, as as Stephen has mentioned. As we wait for him to come back in again, <laughs> guys, you want to send in uh, any questions in the meantime? You're welcome to. You want to send in some views? There's a couple of comments in there already. Just keep sending them in as we try and get Steve back in again. Steve, can you hear me? I can just see you on the bottom screen there. Can you hear me okay? Just give it a few more minutes. I'm sure a lot of you lads out there who are going to Q school are, are, are thinking in terms of getting involved with coaches and for many different reasons. Obviously, to improve your game and, and look at a lot of things that you can't see in your game. And it, it very often, in my view, needs to be observed by a lot, a lot of different coaches from the outside and a lot of good players. And you, you, you very often don't get the honest answer that you're looking for in terms of, of ways to uh, look at your the weak, the weak parts of your game and how do you improve that aspect of it. And that's one of the reasons why we have coaches coming on, why we have players coming on talking about their game. And if you've seen a lot of the streams where we've we've had professionals on talking about their careers, very often, quite a lot of them on the tour, in fact, have had no coaches, very, very little coaching. They've just really just done it off their own bat and, and came in and, and found that it's just easier to, uh, to try and improve themselves rather than go to a coach. But I think that a, a lot of players at the moment are looking at alternatives, they're looking at... Uh, ways and coaches can help them. I think as we just got Steve back in here. Yes, yeah, Steve, we'll get you back. 
Yeah, yeah. The hotel uh, Wi-Fi here, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a little bit of a little bit of a broken screen. Now I was just talking while you were off the screen there. I was just talking about the reasons why players uh, seek the help of coaches and why, and it, it's how how important it is for uh, players to have to have people from the outside, good coaches, take a look at their game and help them. And we're, 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 we're going to be talking about coaching. We're going to be talking about junior coaching a little bit later on. But let's just try and pick up where you left off there, Steve, if you can remember. <laughs> I think it's um, me sort of trying to explain uh, getting the perfect sighting and aiming correctly, understanding how you see straight from a coach's perspective, um, and then, then putting the technique behind all of that. So um, those, those that do it differently can often reach limits um, and they can become very frustrated. And look, we know that, that snooker itself um, is, is quite a game of um, almost a disorder. You know, it's an obsessive disorder. We love the game, but most people will lose unless they win a tournament. So, you know, some of the things that you have to contend with as a player and in your development. Um, I always used to remember one of the early coaching books, you know, get good coaching that will help you accelerate your game or spend years trying to find some answers. And uh, there are many players um, that will find, try and continue finding years uh, to get those answers. Now, what we're not dealing with, obviously, is the element of um, character, temperament, as some would say. But hey, um, if, there's, if there's one thing that you want to put aside in your game is um, the technical issues, then, then get them put aside. There, there was a, I, I had the pleasure of spending lovely time with Bob Torrance, bless him, he, he's, he's passed on. Um, and you know, this guy was Stevie Gallagher's coach, swing coach. And Bob Torrance used to say in his gruff voice, um, do the right things and you will improve. And I'm not very good at the impersonations there, but you know, if you imagine that in a gruff voice, this, this was a, a, a terrific, a terrific man, um, a wonderful, wonderful golf coach. Um, and do the right things and you will improve. And I, my reply to Bob was, knowing what the right things are is also the secret. Knowing what the right things are. Which brings me back to the cricket coach who wouldn't allow me to take a middle off guard. Because my sighting line is slightly to the left. And anybody who understands cricket, if you're batting to the right and your body and shoulders or your head is turned towards the line that the ball is coming, will know that once I was put further back to middle leg would mean that I was looking across the line that the ball was coming to me at, left to right. And that's why I got bowled within three balls couldn't see the ball coming. Now, you know, I've seen one or two comments on the side here, and there's one or two trolls that, that are on the line at the moment. I've seen them, and I think it's a disgrace. And this game needs to be rid of those sorts of people. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say it, facts. You know, one of, the, one of them just continues in the game, um, you know, and it's a disgrace. And people like that need to be shifted out of the game. So... That troll will know exactly who I mean he is, um, and he needs to shift. So if you're going to troll on here, go. If you want me to name the name, I'll name it. Mr. Padgett, please leave the site. Go and troll somebody else. Mm -hmm. Facts. Look, I think that uh, there's times when they come on and make comments so unnecessarily. So guys, if you're going to come on live stream, uh, and make irritating comments, you know, you're, you're really, all you're doing is you're embarrassing yourselves. Simple as that. You know, hang, hang on, Steve. You know, if you're going to come on and make comments about anyone we've got on here and you don't agree with them, then just man up a wee bit, show a wee bit of common sense and ask a question instead of making comments. You know, it's, it's, it's not something I'm too keen on, Steve, but... You know, we don't we don't get an awful lot of harder on the other streams than I do, <laughs> which is probably more of a well, bit of well, You know, we, we live in a game where, 
um, this game needs to be cleaned up. Mental health awareness mm -hmm. week last week. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen so many players uh, in our sport suffering um, during lockdown. And, and they've had the courage to come out and say these things, you know. And anybody in the sport who's going to, um, is going to behave in such a way that is harassing or in any way unacceptable behaviour, I believe the WPBSA needs to clamp down on it and clamp down on it fast. I believe they have a duty of care to every player in the game. Let's get back to normal, Dave. Anyway, Steve, just moving on. I want to talk about a uh, big, big issue here. There's a lot of guys going to play school. There's a lot of there's a lot of players out there who are aspiring to get on the professional snicker tour, yeah. and they're you know they're, they're looking at a lot of different ways to improve their game. They're they're looking they're trying to work out a lot of stuff, they're trying to figure out uh, how to improve their weaknesses, how to assess themselves, get themselves ready, and decide well they're good enough to make a living on the tour. What does it take? You, you've seen a lot of players come and go. You've seen a lot of amateurs. You've seen a lot of guys go to preschool. And you've seen a lot of those players at the lower end of the tour who are really, a lot of them, Steve, are never really going to make a living. So what have they got to do? What have these lads got to do? What, have they, what sort of things have they got to do to take themselves a little bit further? Um, can I answer that in two, in two ways? Hmm. All right, would you mind? Um, Part one is, I think, um, that without doubt, Barry Hearn came into the game, saved the game, and uh, raised prize money beyond all recognition. You know, when we start talking about £15 million on tour, you know, and Barry believes that um, giving opportunity to everybody um, is, is key and uh, rewarding the highest performers and the most successful. And, you know, he's done exactly the same in darts. Um, you know, his, his passion for rewarding success is huge. But I'm from a, a high performance and, a, and a, a, a performance development environment. And I fully recognize that. Reward the top performers, of course. But you also have what we call the also runs. You know, when I I look at a high performance grid, I would look at the stars, the potentials, the also runs, and I will also look at the troubles, the problems. Okay, so I'll put I'll put the tour into four spot into four um, categories, and I could put every one of those 128 players into a specific category. Now, there may be some people that are problem players who could become high potential and then turn into stars because they develop later. And, you know, there was, there was a, a, the narrative will say, well, you know, Barry Hearn has done great for the job, um, great for the tour, and because of so many players, so many tournaments, players are playing better. But one of, if I look back, one of the key successes, five years with, with Stuart Bingham, nine titles in a world championship. You know, he was, he was a self-confessed journeyman. And it wasn't just the number of tournaments, you know, it was because he started to do things right. Um, and, you know, there are some people that are late developers in, in their career, and Stuart was a late developer, you know, and um, I think it's very important for the tour to support all players. So what's very important for me in the first, uh, in the first part of the answer is I believe the tour has a duty to protect those at the bottom as much as reward those at the top. I don't believe any professional snooker player should go on tour and come off tour. I'm not, if I use the word broke, you know, what, what I mean is broken by the tour, not broke because they overspend, but broken by the tour. Um, I, I believe that there should be a minimum level of prize money. And if that's a percentage calculation towards the, the first round, so in the world, let's say 5,000 to the first round winner, I think 1,000 could have gone to the loser and 4,000 to the winner. There were, there were matches that were lost 6-5 and somebody went home with nothing. And, and, you know, if players are going to fall off tour, then fine. If they're not good enough to stay on tour in terms of the system, fine, but they don't need to fall off tour stone broke. So I think there should be a, a, 
you know, a modicum of, of, of pay at the bottom end through the prize money structure. And I don't think it affects the top end because actually first round prize money could be split 25, 75% winner and loser. So if someone goes home with something, not BFH in the words of um, Bullseye. Well, it's not even BFH, is it? It's expenses down the pan and it's a loss. It's not like golf where people will compare and say, um, they'll compare and say, if you don't make the cut, you don't get paid. That is correct. But in snooker, we're a knockout environment. It's a knockout tournament. You don't play two rounds and hopefully you'll be on the top 72. It's a knockout environment. You could be playing great snooker and play the world number one and lose. And I don't Do believe... Know? Sorry, go on. Steve, do you not think there's too many professionals on the tour? I mean, let's, let's have a look at the numbers here in terms of business. We've got 128 tour professionals. A lot of the guys at the bottom there are barely making a living. That tells me it's bad business. There's, there's, too, many, there, there, there's too many people there. Well, well, you can do one of two things, really. You can either say, deal with what I said in terms of the prize money, then you could sustain 128. Um, or to a degree, only to a degree, mind, but it would be a low level of pay, or you cut the tour down. But if, if it's still going to be first round losers don't get paid, it doesn't change the situation. You're going to have 49 to 64 go broke, roughly, give or take. Um, so, so I think pay at the bottom end, you know, should recognize that they're a professional. They come through a qualifying process to be a professional. They've earned tour status recognized by the tour as a professional and i think they should be paid as a professional but yeah. i don't want to take anything away from the very high level environment because there is one thing that barry also claims and he's 100 percent right his process of i'm going to use the word brutality on tour you know sport is brutal is that he has raised the game. If you look at the standard on tour, it's huge now. Um, you know, the strength and depth is huge, but there is still a lacking in certain areas of the game when you look at some of the, the, the lower ranked players and the newer players, because they're not coming on to the tour with the level of, um, of what, what should I call it? Um, craftsmanship that so many of the older players have developed. Mm. But, if we turn around then and say, okay, there's part one, I believe the tour should be a safe environment, but not a sanctuary. So I don't believe people should just get on tour to earn 30 grand, 40 grand minimum. But what I don't believe is that someone losing first rounds, everything should be less than maybe 15 grand a year to survive at least. They're going to drop off the tour, don't forget. So if they are not good enough in terms of prize money, they're going to drop off. So it doesn't change that bottom end in terms of are you good enough or bad enough to, to stay on tour. So there's my view in terms of prize money. It can be easily resolved, and I don't like to think of players going broke um, when they're trying, when they're trying to contribute, and they've, they've worked and devoted their life to what they want to try and do. I think that in turn reflects further down the line. At the moment, sadly, is it? Is it easy to, to, to recommend becoming a, a world snooker tour professional as a career? Is it easy for anybody to give that career guidance? There is no career guidance. There's a structure of sorts, but there's no real career guidance. Um, there's, no, there's no one best way for juniors to be taught the game because all different coaches are doing all different things. Um, you know, we'll talk about the junior program maybe later that, that, we're, that, we're, that we're, we're bringing out. But there's no one best way, is there? Because I've got different coaches doing different things. And I've seen it on the internet. So different accredited coaches are doing different things. So, so juniors coming up through the game have either got what some people call natural talent, um, but they don't have the ring craft that some of these older players have. Um, and then you've got um, players who perhaps believe that they're better than they are because they haven't been tested in amongst um, these better players because if you look at the tournaments that you put on, the only way you get tested is if you're out playing against the next world champions, the next world title winners, the next tour winners. Um, so your pro-am structure and, and that kind of structure, the tournament structure, 
compete with to get really strong ring craft just isn't there. And and there's a part of me that I feel that these, these forthcoming pros, they've kind of been, I'm going to use the words, it's, it's hard facts for me, I'm going to use the words. I feel they've been let down a bit. I feel, I feel at the bottom end, the development pathways are not providing what they should be providing. The junior club pathways are not providing what they should be providing. So, so constant, so consequently, we, we get, we'll have talent come in from other areas, and I think the UK is struggling. I mean, players are making mistakes too, Stephen. I mean, I, 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 I talk about. I mean, I, I, I talk about maybe the fact that there's too many professionals on the tour, but that's not without reasons. There's, there's many reasons why I say that. I say that because I feel that, you know, there, there, there's quite a, there's quite a, there's quite a, there's quite a big difference in standard, I think, on the tour between the, the, the top 32 and the rest, with the rest of the crew on there, which makes me think, should there not be a pro amateur qualifying tour and uh, be an elite 64 tour? And then maybe split the money up that way a little bit, yeah. you know. And then you can, you know, you, you can look at it from that perspective. Yes, your your view is shared by many others. You know, uh, Chris Henry, Barry Pinches, and a lot of other players on the tour, senior players on the tour, who've been on the tour for twenty years, believe that maybe some of that money should be spread out a little bit more. Because after all, these guys have qualified as tour professionals. They've got on that tour. They they. Maybe deserves something as a reward for, for playing that first qualifier. Uh, it is quite quite difficult, but I mean, are players not making mistakes themselves, though, Steve? I mean, are, are players are players making bad decisions? Well, there's there's delusion, isn't there, to a certain degree, and that's that sort of sounds hard, but you know, um, there's there's dreams. You know, we're, we're, there's a dream out there. You know, go to Q school, become a pro, and 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 be a Judd Trump. Um, you know, that's a dream. It's easy to sell a dream. The reality of making that dream come true, you know, requires the level of vocation, dedication and getting everything right that Barry Hearn talks about. There's, there's not much money in our, in our sport for these um, amateurs. They're not deemed as elite athletes the way they are, for example, in Hong Kong. You know, um, an elite, uh, an, an amateur um, snooker player in Hong Kong could be in an, in an academy mm -hmm. and, you know, and have a wonderful time um, to a degree, okay? You know, almost to the point where is there a value to becoming a pro? Um, you know, we, we don't have the funding in the UK for this sort of stuff, um, but equally we don't have the, I don't think we have the development pathways, um, the development structure in the UK um, to, 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 to make or more importantly, to help juniors and youths become better than they thought they could be, you know. So consequently, they measure themselves against their own local uh, people. They measure themselves against their own various local standards. Mm -hmm. um, they don't understand the pressure of a tour. Um, and so consequently, they go into it rather blind. Why? Well, if you look at good management companies in golf, they will recommend when an amateur turns professional. It will be part of the structure. We don't, we don't have many management companies anymore in, in snooker. You know, there's no need to really career guide for these people. Stephen, this is a big problem. I think we've got structural problems right across the board here. Uh, and they need to be looked at. And uh, a lot of those stem from the very beginning, the very grassroots. Are we, are we getting away from grassroots here? We get are we getting away from the things that we should be looking at here in terms of junior coaching, coaching uh, development uh, in the game. Are we are we getting away from all this? No, I, I think I think ultimately from top to bottom, um, there, there's a disconnect. Um, there's a disconnect where perhaps people are not listening to the right people, the people who really are involved in the grassroots. Mm -hmm. Um, just running a tournament for juniors doesn't doesn't work the development side. Um, different standards of coaches coaching juniors, you know, you have to question that. You know, doesn't doesn't I, I look at it and think, well, doesn't a junior that I coach deserve the best from me, the same as I give to Ronnie O'Sullivan? Uh, if if Chris was seeing a junior, you know, that junior is seeing the best coaches in the land, but. When, when we turn around, arguably, and, and 
you know, some people might argue this, but if you look at um, the two main coaches on tour, it's Chris and myself. So, you know, how many juniors are accessing this level of knowledge? They're not. So, so within, within our network, within the global network, you know, Stephen Hendry will say, Sightright is the one best coaching method to follow. That's his view. And we're rolling, we'll be rolling out junior stuff. We want, we want somebody in Glasgow, a junior in Glasgow, to be trained exactly the same way as the junior in um, Bristol or the junior in Norwich. Not that they're not all individuals, they are. But technically, there's no, there's no real, what I would call, one best way for these juniors to learn and to catch up with the modern game. The modern game is not the blueprint that, that is being coached. Now, that's hard. It's very good. Too. Juniors, I think it's difficult to uh, coordinate these things. It's difficult to... Uh, very hard. It's really hard work with juniors. And it's hard to get them to watch... This kind of thing, the kind of thing that we're talking about, the, the kind of things that me and Chris Henry have been talking about, you know, over the last few months, it's very, very difficult to actually get them. Uh, a lot of the juniors that I know are really good. Some of them are really potentially potential potential tour tour professionals, and they're they're just not asking the right questions, Steve. They're 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 they're, they're not watching. They're not watching and listening to these. They're not asking the right questions. There there some of them are getting very bad advice. Uh, some very bad guidance from sponsors and other people and um, sometimes too much pressure but quite a lot of the juniors that I've seen them um, uh, uh, just I, I just I just wish they'd maybe get involved this is one of the things we're trying to do with the pro arms and this is well, some of the things I want to speak to you about and I see you this week you know at the Stratford Club that is going to introduce a, a junior uh, coaching program uh, where we, uh, you know, we, we, we're involving some extra professionals. So, I mean, is that the way forward here? Do we need, how far do we need to take this, Steve, in terms of, of getting juniors in the right direction? What do we need to do fundamentally? I think, I think the game changer element in this is uh, making sure that we talk to the right people who can influence at the right level, not be told from upwards downwards. Um, and I think I think there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, there are there's a whole infrastructure in the UK of snooker, but actually you've probably got a greater number of youths playing pool than they are playing snooker. And you've only got to look at some of the big clubs that see that that have and house so many more pool tables than they do snooker tables. So there's a reason there. There's a reason. If juniors won't waste their time anymore, if they can't do something, they're off. They're, they'll want to learn quickly and they'll want to do things quickly. They want to complete things quickly. They're, juniors are far more advanced than we ever were in our day. You know, their dexterity with different things is, is completely different. Their understanding, you know, they're, they're seeing football at a different level. They're seeing tennis at a different level. Every sport has moved forward. But I don't believe our junior, I don't think um, the availability uh, of access to high quality, and I mean high quality coaching is there. And, and that's not to be disrespectful to, to so many coaches that are, um, that are working in their junior clubs because lots of these are working so hard. But there's a, it's, it's, all, it's, it's not coordinated. There's, there's, there's not one thing bringing them all together. So there's no measure. So if I if I turn around and look at the reason that we've um, that we've launched the uh, site right accredited clubs is because we want the coaches to choose the coach for their club. We want the club to be owning the responsibility of coaching that goes on in their club. We want we want it to be a good arrangement. We want it to be a win-win situation. You know, just to just to to, to walk in as a coach into a club and see a client and the club not know whether or not that was good or bad, you know, just isn't right to me. Alan Sugar wouldn't allow that sort of process in his shop. And, and every snooker club is a shop. Every snooker club has customers and those customers deserve the best. And the club managers that I'm speaking to at the minute, that's, that's what they want. 
Now, that means that puts a whole onus and emphasis on the people that are delivering a service in that club needs to be seen by that club as being the best or the best that they can get or doing the best and delivering the best. So there's an accountability there. Let's talk about snooker clubs and snooker academies, Steve. What, what do they need to do? What are snooker clubs who are really interested in getting involved with juniors um, maybe partly thinking about setting up academies coaching academies and i mean we don't have that many snooker academy we've got dings academy up there you know which is bringing a lot of really talented lads and kids but are they doing enough what do clubs and academies need to do here um i i would happily run a full conference at dings academy you, you know from the discussions that we've had that you know um I'm enjoying um, a lot of good stuff at Dings Academy. We're, we're launching, we're doing our coach courses there. Um, we're running those. We're running uh, coaching weeks there, um, UK and international coaching weeks. Look, I, I've got governing, I've, I'm in talks with certain people, development officers, etc., within governing bodies who feel that they can't coach without Sightright as part of their coaching uh, module. And, you know, these things become very important to us. So, um, governing bodies, clubs, what, what they're wanting is that they're wanting to move forward and they're wanting to move forward quickly. So for any club, league, you know, I'm happy to run the appropriate conferences uh, at Dings Academy or, or online for these people that wish to understand what makes a good junior academy. How can we get juniors into not the clubs, the, the leagues? How can we get... <coughs> Excuse me. How can we get an interest? And I mean an interest because I know, I know Chris Lovell has done an awful lot of work in schools. But is that translating into those people in schools coming into clubs? You know, there's, there's a big difference here because, you know, certain coaching levels don't are not really teaching snooker. Well, we want to teach snooker. I, I don't want to teach maths. I don't want to teach. You know. I'll, I'll do the adding up in a break. I, I want to teach snooker. You know, if we've got juniors that want to play snooker, I want to teach them. If we want to give schools an opportunity for this sport to be recognised as a sport, we want to teach them. So the junior, you know, I've been having a discussion with one or two people. I've, I've got, um, you know, I, I know that Carlisle, Carlisle District League, don't, don't have any coaches in their league. You know, I mean, hey, how can you ever run a junior development program in a league that doesn't have any coaches? You know, so so we've got a disconnect going on. So I've kind of got to the, you know, lockdown for me has been really strange because the world has been crazy with the world qualifiers in the world. And I felt I've been away for months, um, you know, and I've seen I've seen players almost lose their minds, you know, um, you know, because of certain things in, in, in the sport. Um, but for me, the root cause is where we need to go to solve this junior development in the UK. And that root cause has not been identified by other people, in my opinion. Um, and and I believe we've ident I believe, and we'll have more discussions on Wednesday. I believe this can and has and is obvious. And sometimes, sometimes what's obvious misses people um you know we we have a wonderful network in the uk of snooker but people need to be involved and empowered in helping that grow um and i believe that it's a certain certain places where we can um, affect that and give people the opportunity to really contribute and to make them feel valued where they can then want to actually develop things in, in their respective regions and areas. Um, and I think it starts there. But let's face it, if I go to a school and I offer a programme and the programme comes with the backing of what the individual has achieved, that school is probably going to be interested if I if I can support it with results. In the UK, do we really recognise snooker as a sport at the minute? 
Well, perhaps maybe that's not the case. It's going to take a bit more work there. Just so touch so on. Will, so will schools recognise it as a proper sport? So therefore, there must be, I should imagine, in certain schools at the minute, there's probably conversations that go on, you know, that maybe see it as a, I don't know, do they really see it as something that they would support? Would they send children to a snooker club instead no. of sending them to a cricket club? No. Well, they will not. That's not the feedback I'm getting. The, fe the feedback I got from uh, from from some colleges is that if 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 one of, say a junior, if you want to call him, a, I mean, if kids are not at college or school. Say some kids are at school at the age of fifteen or sixteen. If, if they have very obvious obvious ability and have got on the tour, like some sixteen-year-olds have actually got themselves on the tour. You know, the question is, is that too young? Are they too young to get on that snooker tour? Uh, that's that's debatable. But and, and the feedback I've been getting, Steve, is that if they're good enough to turn professional on a snooker tour, then that they will be endorsed. They will be supported. supportive. That's the feedback I'm getting. Yeah. Just like if they were a professional sports person in cricket or football or they were offered a, a contract, yeah. You know, the same for a football team at the age of 15 or 16. And um, the schools and the colleges do nothing but support that very, very naturally. Yeah. And they but, support it because it's a, it can be seen as a bona fide career in a, in a career guidance module. And at the moment, if we have, you don't really have footballers coming away from the sport not having earned any money. Um, you know, and, and I think if we change this, then maybe just maybe the attitude will change towards these people that are pushing up but it needs to go down through the levels so when we when we turn around and make comparisons you know i think people who graduate for the professional tour need to graduate and earn a minimum salary when they go on that tour um and i believe that the secondary tours beneath need to really be i think there needs to be a look at them a very very close look at them and then even beneath that. And I don't think that we have a tiered structure throughout the whole career progress of a snooker player that, that kind of puts it into the qualification and classification of a sport. Steve, let's talk about the expense of this. OK, well, we haven't touched on that. All right. This is this is this is quite important. I mean, snooker, like like any, any, you want to call it a hobby, you can call it a hobby. These are not lads who are just going down at the weekend out a game of snooker. A lot of these kids are spending a lot of hours in the snooker halls, okay? So they're spending a lot of money playing on a good quality table. I mean, not a, a lot of the good clubs have got star tables, very fast cloth with professional conditions, and they're, they're paying up to 10 and 12 pound an hour. You know, and they're, they're investing a bit of money. So uh, it's not just the cost of of playing time in their, in their clubs. It's investing in a table in the house if you're very privileged to have that space, for one thing. Uh, uh, if you have a sponsor, it's okay too. So if you have a sponsor, that's great. There's that financial support. But in terms of, of coaching, how do, we, how do we help this problem in terms of... Uh, expenses um i think it then comes back to the I, I if you work on a pyramid if we look at if we look at the bottom line and we start saying um healthy junior academies in um in various counties and clubs healthy junior academies where the club can see the value invested in looking after those players um and developing them through the tournament process if you've got a good healthy club you'll normally have good healthy conditions so i i think a natural a natural growth skill level in those people um will come by um almost like an organic growth if we then turn around and look at those people who feel at a young age that i must have my own table because i want to become a pro and the standard on on the pro circuit is such that i need to be playing on the same conditions we're talking about elite juniors elite juniors that want to accelerate quickly and i see no problem in that so i think the difference between you know we again we talk about juniors will develop and all players will develop at different stages in their lives from, from a junior to a youth to an adult to almost, you know, a 30-year-old. 
So if we turn around and look at those development structures, if we then turn around and say, well, how do we service those particular layers? Um, then, then I think the junior and the development of the game would grow a lot quicker. But at the moment, what we have is we have uh, juniors who are few in number to a degree, um, who are then wanting the best conditions because that's what they see on TV or they're going into certain tournaments where that's what they see and suddenly it becomes, becomes a craze. Um, it's like a local uh, junior golfer playing at his local club but wanting to play on the conditions of uh, Wentworth, you know, and it just doesn't happen. Where you get those conditions is is in high level pro and or high level junior elite competitions where you get used to those uh, you get used to those conditions so you know if i look at someone like stephen hendry he's happy playing on a club table a good a good when i say club table it's a good star table but he's not bothered about all the lighting you know he's not bothered about whether or not it's the tv lighting or whatever it's a table mm -hmm. Now, the difference in terms of cloths and the difference in terms of playing conditions seems to vary so much. And, and the way that these conditions are put in place at certain timings is what makes people further down the line as we push down that suddenly think, well, unless I have those conditions, I can't play this game. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a mentality towards I must have better conditions to play better snooker. <laughs> Getting a bit of attention here. What do you want? There's, you also the element, there's also the element that says, from a technical point of view, um, there are many of us top coaches um, who perhaps need to understand that the difference in terms of reaction and the way club players play on a normal club table is completely different to what we've got on match tables. So if the sport understands that, then the sport would make sure that we provide for that difference, the disparity in terms of super fine cloths, like a, a, a 12 stint meter at Wentworth, compared to a typical high level profile pro-am where the club has got the greens in perfect condition, but they may not be Wentworth style, but they are still in perfect condition for a high challenge tour. We now want a challenge tour that has all pristine star tables. And that's where that's some of the problem. Is there enough money in the game to provide that middle level? Are people expecting too much? Maybe. Oh. Maybe. I would rather see money. I would rather see money put into an awesome pro am circuit, an awesome mid tier circuit, the development tour as we as we learn to understand it, be it the challenge tour or the Q tour, whatever mm -hmm. that's going to look like when it comes out. I'd rather see prize money put in there. Good prize money. I would rather see. I would rather see pros who qualify for the tour card in in, in Q school next week or in uh, later on this month. You know, get five thousand pounds for qualifying, so it kicks them off and gives them a bit of a start in finances. I'd rather see those in the top sixteen on the order of merit get a couple of grand. You know, for 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 their performances um, in Q school. You know, I'd rather see that than perhaps. Yeah. spend fortunes on some of the things that are being spent fortunes on that's touch on q school steve okay uh, let's talk about q school okay uh what are your views on q school the format the qualification the numbers getting on the tour coming off the tour do you have any views on this is there ways we can improve this yeah i think um look, I you know, a bit. I'm, I'm not. I'm not as entrenched in the um, in the idea of uh, the open draw as Barry is from from the old days. But what I do remember from the old days is that the typical uh, eight up, eight down was a pretty good structure. Now, obviously, um, you know, we're dealing with a bigger tour. I I would probably take a look at um, however many tours are relegated, however many pros are relegated. I think there should be playoffs from Q school against those relegated. Uh, pros. Um, I don't believe those pros should be back into Q school um, because I don't believe it's fair on the up and coming uh, section of players um, for, for bad luck or good luck in a draw 
to be drawing a seeded player. I believe the seeds are right, but I don't believe the structure is right. So the structure that they've given, I believe that the relegated pro should be seeded. But I don't believe the yeah. relegated pro should be in in the Q school. I think the top players in Q school should play off against the relegated pros. My understanding, if I'm correct, Steve, my understanding of this time round is that it's seeded. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be frightful because because yeah. all of these amateurs, um, unless some of them, I guess, in the UK have been breaking the law because unless they had elite status, they shouldn't have been practicing. Um, you know, um, and my, my argument there would have been that maybe Q School could have been out earlier in the year in terms of entries so that those people who entered would have been given a lead status to practice and be ready for Q School. So there's a lot of amateurs, UK amateurs, who will not be ready for this Q School. And perhaps, mm -hmm. so I don't know what the numbers are, but someone said there's about 120. So um, I believe numbers are considerably down. But I feel sorry for those amateurs um, one that haven't been able to practice because it's their dream. We, these, these people want to play the game. They want to become professional. They're dreaming about it probably every day. You know, wake up in the morning dreaming. Um, snooker is their life. Um, and they're going to, by luck of the draw, end up against certain seeded players who've been playing on tour all two years. You know, two years have been playing on tour. And... Uh, and there's some good players that have dropped off, and they've dropped off for a multitude of reasons. Siju He, uh, si, I always forget how he pronounced his name. Siju He, you know, I think was, was recognised, I think, by even Stephen Hendricks, one of the best young Chinese players. He's dropped off tour, you know. And so, is it right for an amateur that's, that's had no Q tour, no challenge tour, no comp competition snooker over the last 12 months? Is it right for those players to pay money and be, be potentially drawn up against one of those seeded players in each tournament? It's very, uh, Steve, a very bad decision in my view. Very negative feedback from a lot of the players, amateurs I've spoken to. Uh, spoke very negative, negatively of this. They yeah. feel it's a very, very bad decision. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a bit of a kind of step back. Um, I, I, I can't. I, I, I voice, you know, I voice my that as I call it the hard facts. If we're going to have the pros in Q school, I do think the pros should be seeded because I've seen occasions where many occasions have been drawn against each other, and I and I just don't think that that is correct. But I don't think it's correct that the, the relegated pros are in Q school. So therefore, I wouldn't have that position. I would be playing Q School, and from the order of merit of Q School, which is, as Barry Hearn always wants, he wants a fair playing field. He makes that statement many, many times, and a fair playing field for Q School is not having relegated pros in it. Relegated pros, I think, deserve to have a playoff against the top, however many they are, from the order of merit. Be it, be it best of 19, a proper playoff, not best of 7 or best of 9 or 11, a proper best of 17 that gives both parties a fair and equal chance, except for the fact that the relegated pro does have the advantage, but if, if the people from Q School have come through Q School, at least they've got play under their belt. So, would I have relegated, will I have relegated pros in Q School? No. Would I have a playoff? Yes, it used to work, and it used to work brilliantly. A lot of these pros are going to get back on, Steve. They're going to drop, they've dropped off. Uh, well, I don't know. I can see up to half of them getting back on again. Can you not? Um, it's weighted in that. Why is that? You know, the, the evidence would suggest that, you know, the odds, um, li listen, you know, You'll laugh at me, really, because sometimes when someone comes to me and says, my, my player can be world champion, I will just pick up the betting odds and say, well, let's have a look at the odds. Um, look at what the odds would be in Q school, you know, and then ask yourself, is that a fair and equal playing field? So if Siju here is against, um, I don't know, let's say, for argument's sake, Sydney Wilson. I'm not writing Sydney Wilson off, so Sydney, if you're on the line, you know exactly what I mean here. Um, Siju here is going to be favourite. 
if it's someone who's um, coming up through the ranks and hasn't had as much experience as Sidney Wilson, then the odds the odds on for Sidney here is going to be huge. You know, and and if if the bookie was laying odds for those pros to be um, re-promoted, um, I think that would evidence that it's not a level playing field. Now, you know, put all the amateurs. You can't you can't mix, in my opinion, relegated pros with amateurs. You play off against them like football does. You play off. You have a playoff. There's certain people that can get promoted. So you could argue right. that the top four people in Q school get an automatic promotion and the next lot play off. Yeah. Yeah, I can't be a level playing field. Um, see your views on that there, Steve, very clear. You know, and I think that a lot of players are, are, are going to Q school thinking and knowing that uh, up against it. Uh, I gather numbers this year, by the way, are very low in terms of uh, of of players. Um, I'm, I've been told to read about 120 entries. Yeah, is that significant? Is that, is that obviously think obviously due to COVID uh, practicing? I I I feel I feel for the amateur scene. I really do. I I think you know the you, between between we have these discussions the junior and the amateur scene needs needs investment and and i'll be frank the women's the women's tour needs investment i think decisions that are being made around um around these elements uh possibly because investment isn't there i, I don't know um but as a sport the women's tour needs investment just like the ladies golf just like the ladies tennis and then we wouldn't be having some of the issues that and, and some of the feelings that, that came out over wild uh, tour cards. They're not wild cards either, they're qualifying cards. Um, but when you look at the amateur scene, you know, world amateur, being world amateur champion should, should really mean something. Being English amateur champion should really mean something. We're not a global sport if certain standards in certain countries wouldn't, wouldn't really warrant Olympic status. And there's so many countries at the moment that wouldn't really warrant because, you know, the standard just isn't there. We've seen it. But, you know, does it mean you have to give something to something, uh, to an entity to try and move it forward? I don't believe that. I believe you create, create the opportunity within those entities to raise the standard to then qualify. And I'm looking at juniors and I'm looking at amateurs, the amateur scene, we need to raise the standard and we need to raise the standard with investment in it. That means a motivation to play. So provide these amateurs with a motivation to play. Look, I'm going to state a hard fact. If there was, a, if there was the same money on the women's tour as there was on the men's tour, would the women that were given a tour card stay on the men's to well the main tours not the men's tour they wouldn't i'm sorry but they wouldn't they play on the women's that'd be my view so the amateur tour needs money the women's tour needs money for the benefit of all of the women's tour not just one or two people the women's tour needs money it needs investment the amateur scene needs investment if that has to come from the pool of money that comes on, on to, into into the main tour, why not? Why not take a percentage? Why not have a negotiation with these with the sponsors who obviously I know COVID is affected. So I'm asking for a you know an ideal world here. But why not commute some of that money, some of that sponsorship into the respective tours to fund them? Fifteen million Sorry? Or world's going to make there steve in terms of of money because a lot of that money is sponsored of uh, in fact all of its sponsorship money sponsorship money comes with everything else doesn't it it comes with marketing comes with television it comes yeah. with betting it comes with uh every single bit of little marketing tool you can possibly come up with in terms of promotion and entertainment on tv yeah. so i mean not, not all that stuff comes together does it it doesn't, but there's negotiation that goes on within that, and the betting companies need 
need the sport, I guess, as much as we need them. And, and you know, I know some people would prefer us to get sponsored money from elsewhere. And look, the people who bring in this money, you know, what a, what, what a wild, you know, amazing, amazing um, attraction of funds to the sport has happened. But we can't allow the bottom end to die. We can't, we can't allow the amateur game and the junior game to actually fall off a cliff edge because that's what's happened to 14 pros on tour this year. They fell off the cliff edge, you know, and um, some people say, well, they fell off because they weren't good enough. Well, there were different things that happened through the year. COVID affected one or two. Um, you know, if we look at the amateur tour, it needs money. If we look at the ladies tour, it needs money. And if we look at the junior, it needs structure. It needs it needs what I call a development structure, not just a competitive structure. But and that's I think that's a that's a big area we need to fix. That's just where that's that's touch on the bottom end there, Steve. That's touch on the bottom end. Let's talk about amateur sugar, okay? Amateur. So amateur sugar in general. Okay, I, I, I get people coming to me saying, why, why don't you create an amateur tour? I think it's very difficult for me to create an amateur tour outside what I'm doing because uh, there, there has to be an end goal. There has to be, there would have to be something like a tour card. There would have to be something a little bit better than the Q tour that, to which I'm not particularly impressed with. You know, there needs to be something a little bit better for amateurs in terms of... Uh, taking them where, where they want to be okay so how do we improve the amateur game what do we need to do um I, i'm again i'm going to answer that in two parts we've seen events where they've allowed amateurs to go and pre-qualify for uh, main tour events um germany or wherever it was the various different you know like a, i forget what they were called um and, and they were paying something like five, six hundred pounds, not just to enter, but for a flight accommodation. And they were going through three or four days of qualifying, and invariably, none of the amateurs made it on, made it to any stages at pro level. They all went out the, the last level. So why, what is it that is making these amateurs um, enter something like that collectively, individually and collectively? Whereas if suddenly all that money could be put into the tournament of their own and then receive a prize money, because none of them got any prize money. Now, is it because they're going for a jolly? Is it because it's a day out? You know, I remember Steve Davis once saying, some people go for a day out. Is it, is it a weekend out? Is it a trip away? Um, or actually, do those people genuinely believe that they're going to a professional tournament? So I could never understand to a degree why so many spent so much money for nothing. Because very few got through, if any. I think only one, only once, once or twice. So we're talking about, I guess the numbers were something like 200, 200 people going in for these, I might be wrong. Or I put quite a lot. So the amateur scene does have money. Otherwise, they wouldn't have entered. Now, that may have changed in terms of COVID. I think it's I think it's something that you touched on earlier. The tour card, the challenge tour, the Q tour, it hasn't um, materialised properly yet. There isn't there isn't a clear structure. There isn't an acknowledged structure. One guy one guy didn't get entry into the world this year, even though he was like third or fourth on the order of merit. So, what is the challenge tour? What is the order of merit? What status does it have? Why should anybody who's third or fourth on the order of merit be second choice to anybody else in terms of a talk, uh, in terms of a place in the world championship, when actually they've already been on into one or two tournaments as top ups from the order of merit? Merit. What? What is it? Why? Why is the order of merit on a challenge tour seen as second to anything else? If it's because the sponsor wants them, well, sponsors rule. But it. I don't think it was you know it was decisions made for for other reasons so the order of merit needs to be a status it needs to be you know a credible a really credible tour where every amateur looks at that and thinks 
this is worth being on. Now, for that to happen, there needs to be prize money. If that means the entries are paid out to a certain degree, you know, obviously there's cost going on here, but there is money in the game. We know there's money in the game. So the amateur tour needs funding. If it's funding within the amateur's prize money being paid out, um, if it's giving it over to somebody like yourself to run something that is independent, something where the prize money comes in, there's an order of merit structure in place that everybody sees as being run totally, completely fairly. I'd have been furious if I'd have been the individual who didn't get a place at the World Championship when I was next on the list, when actually invites to the World Championship when one person couldn't make it, it was given to another. And I've, I've invested in tour school, I've played my heart out to get on to third or fourth on the order of merit, and then an invite gets preference over me for a, a world championship. I, 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 I would have to look at it and say, why would I pay a thousand pounds for that tour? Now that, yeah. that sounds like huge criticism, but these amateurs need to be they need to be treated, the ones that go on Q School, they are our next layer of world champions, tour winners, title winners. They're going to come from that pool. And I don't think that they're given enough status. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they should be spoiled with what they believe to be the finest of tables in the world, you know, that actually might be taking the money away from them that is needed in prize money for it to be a credible tour where they can actually make a living like maybe the years ago, Martin Clark, probably, he used to clean up on virtually every tournament every weekend. Nigel Bond, Barry Pinchers, to name just but a few. You know, they used to be, if you were good, if you were in the top eight on the amateur circuit, you would probably do pretty well on the tour, on, on the amateur pro-am circuit. And, and I think there's a mix between how we credit certain tours and how we really reward these amateurs to keep them highly motivated. I think the amateur game needs needs a lot of focus. I think you know you, you touched on the possibility of an amateur tour. I, I I couldn't create that without sponsorship money. Um, in, in that respect, I don't think I could do that. It's difficult. I, I'm not too concerned about an end point being a tour card. I think that. One of my jobs as, as an events organizer is, is really to, to, to make a, a very clear, very clear to players about decisions they're making. But rather than that's why I have a very short format where players can decide whether they're good enough. My events are designed for top amateurs and lower rank professionals who can just keep themselves in, in shape, really, and test, keep themselves tested if they, they don't win their qualifying matches. That's the whole purpose of my, my format. But what you do, Dave, is is running running amateur tours is incredibly, incredibly important. Carol Starvin in my day used to turn up at tournaments and there was 128 booked in and there used to be a waiting list, but there used to be good prize money. Now, me as a player, if I was if I looked at what I'd spent as an amateur on tour with the amount of money that I spend in hotels or entry fees, um, and then I took a view commercially. If I was paying £200 for a tournament where I was likely to get something out of it, if I did well, maybe last 16, um, I'd prefer to go into that tournament. The problem is we've got, we've got tournaments that are not paying out. They're not paying out. So if you had, if you had 128 people, let's quickly do the maths. If you run 128 people and it was a hundred pound entry, 12,800, I would have no problem as, a, as, a, as a, a person who's played this game for most of my life, of paying you a healthy percentage of that to run that tournament and then all the rest of the money goes out and the club supports it because ultimately a rotation of clubs around the country, everybody contributes and we run a great scene. Now, if if 13,000 comes in and you're paid 3,000 pound for the weekend and 10,000 or seven and a half or 8,000 pound goes out in prize money, everybody wins. You win, the club wins, the amateurs win. But that isn't happening. That's gone. Why is it gone? 
Why's it gone? Why, why, why can't there be, you know, in fairness, why can't there be 10 tournaments a year for these amateurs paying £1,000 over the course of the year, £100 a tournament on that basis? You'd run 10 tournaments, make 30 grand out of it. You're entitled to make 30 grand out of it. You're entitled well, I think, to I think setting up the structure of that is probably the difficult part there, Steve. I think that, you know, looking at, looking at large numbers, looking at 64 entries, you know, looking at, looking at the number of people who are realistically going to pay that sort of money. Uh, and, are. And, they are paying it. They're paying. Oh, they pay, but they need they, they they need a venue. They need a venue, and you know those. Uh, as I say, the old days, the days of those sixteen table snooker clubs are long gone. You know the the days of us. We're, we're, I think we're at a stage at the moment where, you know, I, I I mean I'm looking at the possibility maybe next year of a snooker academy or developing some of the clubs that I'm using into a snooker academy, and that, you know, we'll talk about personally. We'll, we'll talk about those things midweek. You know, and there's lots of potential for that to happen, but it needs funding. It needs proper organisation, and uh, you know, it needs a very, it needs a very healthy, well organised uh, setup. It's very difficult to do. It's not easy to do, and I think what you're saying is it needs a dedicated individual to be paid appropriately to run what is the amateur game in the UK. And I fully agree with you. And it's worth a good salary. And therefore, when we turn around and look at the money in the game, all the pros will get the value out of their game. I'm going to, I'm going to say something now that kind of, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, look, hard facts. There are many golfers who have set up beautiful academies. I know two in Scotland, all right? They set up good academies for the future of the game. They fund them. They fund them themselves, and then they go on and they get other funding because of the way. And, but golf does have, tends to have more money injected. We understand that. But the players are involved. The retired players, to a degree, or the players nearing the end of their career. Now, Snooker isn't like that. It's not like that. But something could be done. Something has to be done. And if that means funding from the sport itself, then then it needs to be looked at. And if it if it means, you know, that we have good people who are prepared to run good tournaments and and uh, serve the sport, um, then they should fund it because the sport has the funds. So you looking at what you're doing, I think should be funded by the sport. The sport wants to get funded by the government. But hey, there's a, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that will say the funds are there. Now I might, be, I might be completely wrong with that, you know, but there's a lot of people that say the funds are there. I don't know, I don't look at the accounts, I don't know. All right, but the sport needs it. It's funding the top end of the game. There's the bottom end of the game that are falling over a cliff edge financially. And then there's the amateur game, which has got no money in it. Correct? And then there's a junior game, which actually, you know, um, is is broken for me beyond, beyond what it should be. Just, Steve, just before we wrap this up, Okay, we've we've run nearly as long as the Godfather Part One here. You've taken me down a route. I've streamed down. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of very personal information provided from yourself on a very good discussion. What advice? We're going to wrap this up very shortly, and we'll finish off with this, Steve. What advice would you give those lads who are going to Q school next week? Uh, what, what advice would you give them in terms of how they prepare themselves and uh, everything else? What, what advice would you give them? I, I will look at a lot of pros and I will, I will go into an element of high performance, high performance management. I would say to all the pros, all the amateurs, the pros, the pros are applying for their own job. Okay, that's how I explain it to the pros. 
the relegated pros, they're in a restructure, um, they haven't lost their jobs yet, they're reapplying for their own jobs, but there's less jobs than, than the number that, that were there, okay? So they're reapplying for their own jobs. So they've got to be better, they've got to be better than they have been all season, um, and they've got to have the right mindset um, in applying for their own jobs. They've got to play to win. When we turn around and look at amateurs, there'll be some amateurs who really, really believe they've got a chance, okay? Um, then there'll be other amateurs that are there because they're looking for experience. Um, then you've got amateurs that maybe are looking for experience and are probably out of their depth. So here's the thing. Pressure occurs when perceived skill is less than perceived challenge or where perceived challenge is greater than perceived skill. So there will be a number that will feel pressured, they will feel under pressure, and they'll realise that. The ones with less expectation, lower expectations, the ones that are there for experience, will probably feel less pressure. The ones that are there applying for their own jobs again, all right, will feel pressure, but if they realise that they're that their skill level is way above the challenge, then they'll come through comfortably. I've had some amateurs try to contact me for coaching before Q school. I won't do it. And the reason I won't do it is because it's too late. We're at Q school. They should have thought about that a year ago. And I'm not being harsh to them. Um, I'm being realistic, you know? Um, I support the pro that I've got, who's at Q School, and I'm and I'm dedicated to that pro. So for me, other players have left it too late. But relax. For those that are going to enjoy it, enjoy it. For those that have um, the dream, set themselves three barriers, three not barriers, three bars. One, through the course of Q School. What would be the minimum expectation, performance expectation that they would expect? So would they like to finish top 35 on the order of merit or top 14 or top 20? What would be the minimum expectation that they would deem to be a good Q school? Secondly, the next part, what would they see as excellent? So they're in Q school, would they see minimum being okay, I win three matches, or minimum being I'm in the top 50 on the order of merit, or minimum being I win all my first round matches, um, or I'm in the top 20 on the order of merit. It's up to those players to decide in a performance uh, management criteria what those two levels are. Then the third one is what would be the champagne moment. What would be the most amazing week for them? Some could have an amazing week and only finish top 10 on the order of merit because they might see it as the amazing week. For some, the amazing week might be tour back or get, or get a tour card. If you can imagine all of the relegated pros, their minimum expectation may not be to get their tour card back. On the other hand, it may be. And it depends where they sit because some, some people who have been relegated from the tour if they are genuinely only in the top quartile of the amateur circuit, then actually maybe top 10 on the order of merit might be the minimum that they expect, so they get top ups. Mm -hmm. So that career guidance for me, that performance guidance will vary according to each player. But there comes a time when you have to say to yourself, um, what will I be happy with? Mm -hmm. All right. And what do I expect? Because when expectations um, exceed skill set, pressure occurs, underperformance follows. Um, I wish every one of them good luck because I know what it means to them. I wish every one. I think there's a couple of good juniors in there, and those good juniors, um, you know, may spoil one or two results. Um, you know, that in turn, then you, you question, is that a right format? All right, but Barry Hearn's view is sport is brutal. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, 
Steve, there's a lot of ex-professionals going back there to uh, torture themselves even more. <laughs> there will be torture, you know. Um, I, 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 always remember, I always remember Barry saying um, one of the, the, the most intense pressure he ever felt as a pro was falling off tour. Um, and, you know, to, to go back to Q school, um, having already felt that pressure requires a really, really good mindset to then immediately get your tour back, your tour card back. Um, you know, there's, there's some really good amateurs out there. And what we do know is, is that probably maybe 75% of Q school entries should probably be quite strong because mm -hmm. there's one thing that we do know in, in high performance management. 80% of those who are underperforming know they're underperforming. There we are, guys. I hope all of that information is going to help you in some ways. You know, myself and David have probably given you a little bit of a headache over the last hour and 50 minutes. I can't remember how long we've been on here, Steve. But uh, pack with information. Guys, you're going to Q School. We wish you all the best for Q School. Um, I've done the very best for you. We had Chris Henry on last week. We've got another top guy here giving you much advice. You know, this, uh, by the way, all the videos on here, guys, they get uploaded on YouTube on the Pro Am Snooker TV page. Uh, and in the coming weeks, um, I'll be interacting with uh, the likes of this chap here and many others and coaches and sponsors and clubs who are involved with some great coach. And we're all going to try and interact with players. That includes juniors and amateurs, professionals on the tour who want to come along and play. Uh, most of you probably know by now all my tournaments are scratched. There really isn't very much between any of you who come and play in my tournaments uh, every week. Uh, so get involved. If you want to get involved, just drop me a line. Thanks very much, Stephen, for uh, for coming on. And give it, give it a good and really love the audience at Q School. All right? No problem. And, and all, oh. the, all the clubs that have opened up today. All right? Very important. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us, guys. Just stay on the line there, Steve. And okay. uh, I'll catch you all again soon, guys. Good luck to everybody at Q School. Going to give it a break for a few weeks. And uh, we'll uh, maybe we'll get some of you guys who have reached the tour. We'll get you on here and we can talk about your feelings and, and, and everything else. Thanks for joining us.